Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Survival of the Fittest, How to Build a Cyber Resilient Organization. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist here at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's webcast. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion of the webcast will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. So be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentation will be using a, sl a slide deck. So you can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console, and it covers most technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, and feel free, free to submit comments, um, hopefully compl compliments, or um, anything that you'd like to say during the presentation. You can use that Q&A widget as well. And lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand version of the webcast and the slide deck. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our presenters today are Dave Meltzer, Chief Technology Officer at Tripwire, and guest speaker Jeff Pollard, Principal Analyst at Forrester. If you'd like to read more about them, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your console. Starting our presentation today is our guest speaker from Forrester, Jeff Pollard. Take it away, Jeff. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Kate. Happy to uh, be here with everyone today. Really excited to talk about this concept of cyber resilience and what it means to build a resilient organization. It's a topic that's coloring a lot of our research here at Forrester. It's something that comes up quite often as we talk to Forrester clients as well as security vendors. And when we think about security and the continuum it's been on over the last few years, I myself have been in the security space for around 10 years now, uh, we've gone from sort of the dark ages of the Department of No um, to, to in more recent years, acknowledging that we can't stop everything. We have to be smarter about picking our battles, which placed an emphasis on us responding in the right way. And really, I think now, beginning to understand the concept of resilience in security, resilience as it relates to our overall brand, and ultimately how we can return the environment to an acceptable state after an incident, and also what we need to do during one. And so what I'm going to focus on in, in my portion of the presentation before we hand things over to Dave is going to be thinking about some of the self-inflicted wounds that we inflict on ourselves as security practitioners that make our life harder, um, how we slow down our decision making, how we Often we'll focus on maybe the wrong thing, not using our tools and technologies in exactly the right way. And also discuss a lot of the things I'm seeing with clients as I talk to them day in and day out uh, about how they're starting to do things better and, and some of the changes they're making. The four things I most commonly see from security practitioners when they struggle uh, or when they begin to migrate their program from one that focuses on responding to individual events and instead focuses on optimizing a security program and resilience uh, is here in our agenda. And those are bloat in security operations and how we can cut some of that out the challenges in moving to the cloud, eliminating some of the operational blind spots we have from a technology and process perspective, as well as developing our new strategic plans for resilience and how what we've done in the past from a budget metrics and roadmap perspective uh, may not translate to resilience, right? They certainly accomplish outcomes, but it may not be, exact, uh, may not be the exact outcomes that security leaders actually want. The first area that I focus is in cutting that bloat in security operations because 
what I tend to find here is that organizations are often doing things two or three different ways, often spending money on the same thing in two or three different ways, something that Forrester calls expense in depth. And it turns out that there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained if we reorient our thinking and refocus ourselves on what actually matters and what we can control. And I think one of the best examples of that is threat intelligence, which is something I have a background in. Uh, it's something I've, I've worked extensively in. And I absolutely love it. And I think it's incredibly useful for security teams as a source of context as a source to understand what they should be looking for, um, what could be happening, what they might want to think about next. But the way that we often use it is not in a way that gives it uh, very much utility in the average security operations environment. And by that I mean automating it into a feed that gets dumped into a SIM as an example that winds up generating more alerts is probably not the right way for us to achieve the outcome that we're looking for. Uh, we already have too many alerts, right? Uh, most security teams are struggling with those, especially from a security analyst perspective. And so adding even more alerts into that mix isn't something that winds up being particularly useful. More than that, though, it isn't controllable. A company can't decide on the fly to change how they do business or where they do business based on, based on a new finding in a threat intelligence feed or based on a threat intel group. Um, the simple truth is the organization has to do business the way that it does business. Investments are long-term. Um, Strategy is long-term, and you can't just decide on the fly to change it. And so because of that, threat intel winds up being informative, but isn't something that security can wrap their hands around. It's not something that they're going to be able to stop uh, if a nation state decides uh, to attack them, right? They can't convince a particular country not to target the organization. Instead, we should be thinking about using it uh, to tell us what to look for next, right? The next artifact that we, we should search for, the next area that we should attempt to gain data from a security operations and workflow perspective, because that actually allows us to inform our actions and our decisions. An interesting thing that the respondents to our business technographics survey have shared with us, and this is generally 3,000 plus respondents, uh, CIOs, CISOs, senior security leaders around the globe, one of the interesting things they tell us is by far the thing that generates the most security events and incidents that they have to deal with is actually sourced internally, whether it's directly based on an internal incident within the organization, which could be malicious intent or abuse or an accident, right, a misconfiguration, something like that. Um, but if you factor in third-party suppliers that have access to the environment, as well as lost and stolen assets, hard drives, phones, USB drives, et cetera, all of those incidents vastly outnumber the number of external attacks that we deal with. And so when we think about threat intelligence, and we think about insider threat, and we think about our existing telemetry, what we ultimately need to do is start thinking about those in terms of enrichment, right? So threat intelligence is an excellent source of external enrichment to inform us about the trade craft of a potential adversary and how they may attempt to get inside our environment so that way we can make sure that our tools and technologies can appropriately address that. We should think about our internal information, asset, user, other things about a system as a source of internal enrichment that helps us understand what's at risk, the triage, the severity, whether or not we should bump an event up in importance or drive it down potentially because perhaps it's not as important. Um, that's the right way to do it. That's focused on resiliency because that allows us to think about decision making as opposed to a lot of external factors that add more work that may or may not wind up being relevant long term. And what makes the insider problem particularly challenging is that 
our environments are becoming so much more complex at an enterprise level and frankly even at a business unit level. Um, almost every company that I talk to does not have just one cloud. They have three or more clouds, often in the same business unit, and in many cases could have nine to ten plus different versions of clouds across infrastructure, platform as a service, software as a service, across their entire organization. Right? That is a massive challenge for security teams when you are thinking about wrapping your hands around on-premises, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, SaaS, and how you're ultimately going to respond and coordinate building defenses for those types of environments. One of my favorite graphics here at Forrester that some of our cloud researchers put together really profiles the boundaries of control that exist um, in the cloud for technology decision makers, people that are supporting and, and buying um, technology environments. But I love to repurpose it because I think that it's phenomenal for security practitioners um, to understand as well. And what I love about it is they, they go sort of all the way back to the um, early to kind of mid-90s early 2000s with things like the managed ASP model, right, when we were sort of handing, um, it, you know, the application itself to, to someone to build a website and all those sorts of things. And they go all the way through that continuum up to security uh, or to software as a service. And what I find so interesting about it is that the same problems that the business deals with in terms of understanding who controls an asset, right, what the boundaries are, those are absolutely transferable to security teams. Because when you think about the as-a-service models today, if you take an incident that occurs in on-premises infrastructure, then the security team has very tight control of that, right? So you can grab syslogs. You can grab packet captures. You can grab NetFlow information. You have um, full endpoint instrumentation to grab information about it. You understand the configuration completely because you control uh, the application and the device in its entirety. But when you think about shifting that out to an infrastructure as a service environment, or a platform as a service environment, or a software as a service environment, each of those things can change. And so you may not be able to directly grab a packet cache from that environment. You may not be able to get syslog. You may only have access um, to API logs from the software as a service provider. You may not, may not actually be able to get them directly. You might have to submit a support ticket. And that might have an SLA for when uh, that particular vendor will respond to you. And what format will they give it to you, right? Are they going to provide you something you have to download? Uh, or will you be able to access it uh, through a portal? Those are all things that can change. And frankly, they don't change just based on the provider or the delivery mechanism of those services. They actually change based on service levels and subscriptions of offerings even with the same provider if you paid for support in one way um, or one business unit paid for support and another didn't, right? All of those things can potentially change what security has to do. And so when you think about building resilience into that type of environment, right, the ability to respond, uh, the ability to execute well, you want to make sure that you are conducting tabletops that you're simulating investigation incidents, um, and that you're optimizing things so you can understand your constraints, your limitations, your time frames, how long different things might take based on the model. And you want to make sure that you run an incident as if it occurred in one uh, and the other and the other, so that way you can start documenting the requirements and procedural adjustments that might need to take place. Um, because once you understand what's available, once you under, understand that well instrument and environment, how you respond to it, you can start to build out your RACI chart for how you'll get things, where they'll come from, um, and how you'll ultimately wind up having to interact with any service providers as well as the rest of the organization. And what that ultimately allows you to do is to start to understand the operational blind spots that exist um, inside the environment that come from varied architectures, varied infrastructure, 
service providers, and uh, frankly, lots of different fragmented technologies that require different skill sets. A few months ago, I was working with one of our clients here to ultimately go sort of at a high level through exactly what a SOC level one analyst was doing day in, day out uh, inside their organization whenever they saw an alert or an event. Um, every organization is a little bit different. It's pretty high level. But it was interesting to work through exactly how many decisions they have to make when they're analyzing an event, the number of dependencies that each one of those decisions has, um, and uh, frankly, how much pivoting and context switching is required. But I'll get to a little bit of what that looks like in a second. So at a high level, we looked at the alerts as they came in. And the first thing we figured out is every SOC analyst is sort of deciding, is it true or is it false, right? So is, is it a true positive or is it a false positive? Uh, is this something that I need to spend time on and how much time do I need to spend on it? And what I think is even more important about a true positive or a false positive is this question that this CIO asked me, I want all my SOC analysts to be able to close out an event and I want them to know that it isn't the event that comes back to haunt us in six months which I thought was a really amazing way to put it because when you review a lot of the security incidents that happen, right, it gets super easy to be a bit reductive um, and, and maybe even callous about the fact that, um, you know, the alert flashed and they closed it out and didn't pay attention to it. Well, that was one of 50 alerts that came in that hour, right? Um, and any one of those could have haunted the security team six months to a year later. It just happened to be that one. And so it's kind of important to remind ourselves about, you know, the fact that this is hard, right? And if you close out 50 or 100 alerts in a day, um, one of those can come back to haunt you and be disastrous for the organization, but you really don't know which one. So once you get past the true and the false, right, you figure out if it is, and if it's a false positive, you close it out. If it's, a, if it's a true positive, you start to think about where did it come from, right? Is this a network event or is it an endpoint event, right? So what's my source? Where, where did it come from and where did, it, where did it go to, right? So kind of your source and destination. Depending on where it came from, right, what actually generated the alert inside the environment, uh, if it's network, you start asking questions of maybe IP or URL, right? So um, where were they going to? Right, when the alert generated. If it's endpoint, you might be curious about what's the hash, right? What are the characteristics of the file or the object? Uh, and how did it get here, right? What was the delivery mechanism? Was this downloaded? Was it an email? Was it a USB drive? It could be any of those. Uh, and you start to understand each one because they, they dictate the next thing that you need to know, right? The next, the next input for you to execute an action. If it's network related and it turns out to be that IP, um, then you'll probably wind up wanting to understand some aspect of external and internal intel, that enrichment we talked about, right? So what do I know about this, this website? Uh, what do I know about the user that was clicking on it in the system? You might also want to know reputation. So um, is this a site that, uh, that I understand that's been around for a long time or is it relatively new? Uh, has anyone else visited it? So do I have anyone else inside my organization that have actually clicked on that? If it's, a, if it's an endpoint related event, you may want to know the hash uh, of the file itself. You might want to run it through virus total uh, or somewhere else, right, to get some more information. You might want to detonate that in a, uh, in a sandbox. Uh, you might also want to understand if, if there's any other cases that object's been associated with. So have any other events been worked by the security team where an object like that has been seen before? And if it was an email or a website download, then uh, did anyone else go to that? Or were there any other targets, right? Is this a spear phishing campaign or was it an isolated email? Well, the thing about it is those are all the right questions, right? In fact, those, those are all exactly what questions you should be asking. But it gets to be a bit of a content management and workflow problem, primarily because when you start to ask these questions, you wind up in one tool that generated the alert itself, right, where we make that initial uh, decision about whether or not it's a true or a false positive. But then you wind up in a second tool um, if it's a network event, uh, or a third tool if it's an uh, endpoint event, right, uh, all different interfaces. If you close it out, that's probably another system, right, that you have to think about because that might be a ticketing system completely unrelated to where the actual alert came from. If it's an IP address, you might have another tool for that. And if it's a URL, you have yet another tool, right? Um, 
And so really what winds up happening is you start to legitimately ask the question of whether or not you have enough RAM for all these tabs, right? Is 8, 16, or 32 gigs um, enough for you to have you know, browser windows open? And you'll note in my screenshots that I didn't pick on uh, perhaps the most RAM-hungry browser in this. I was kind of favorable and went with the one that's slightly better at RAM management. Uh, but it's a legit question you know, for security analysts because every artifact they find, right, every piece of information that a security team needs um, during the process of an incident leads to a different technology in so many cases that also probably requires a different skill set. So you may have someone that is an absolute rock star on the endpoint um, that suddenly has to dig in and start understanding you know, a network capture uh, or start looking at network-based events because they had the free time to do that. Someone that's a network expert was working a different incident. Um, and so maybe they can't collaborate at that moment. And so we have this issue that teams are really forced to drive technology they're not able to drive the investigation, and they're not really able to analyze and cross-reference. And the reason why they're not is because they spend so much of their time um, context switching between interfaces, right? They spend so much of their time thinking about their saved password and whether it's a fat client or a web interface, and if they type the right password or not, and if they're shared credentials or not. Um, they become administrators of technology and not able to exercise and flex their muscles at being analytic thinkers and problem solvers and deeply curious about incidents and artifacts. Uh, and that is very much caused by the fact that our security technologies are not integrated um, and we haven't yet figured out a way to automate our workflow in a way that satisfies what we need from a technical perspective that also satisfies what we need from a compliance, legal, and regulatory perspective because those are all very different domains. In fact, I generally say that we're much more mature understanding what we should look for from a technical standpoint than we are in understanding what we should look for um, from a compliance regulatory perspective, right? Because those are challenging based on state, based on country, based on data type in many cases. I think the good news, though, as we develop strategic plans for resilience is that things are getting better um, in security, right? We've matured. We're at a point where we start to understand the types of things we need from a technology, people, and process perspective. And the light that I see kind of at the end of the tunnel, tunnel as I think about the good things that are happening, the first, especially when we think about um, technology fragmentation, is we are getting real APIs for our security technology that are actually documented so that we can begin to integrate uh, technologies and we can take advantage of the type of automation and orchestration that's existed for quite a while uh, in, our, in our other technology environments. And so this is tremendous, right? That helps to solve some of that context switching. It helps uh, us to execute a bit faster than we had in the past. Um, we're also able uh, to start understanding that we have to fuse detection, protection, and response, right? We don't pick one of the three. Um, we need all three of them. They all need to integrate with each other, and they all should create a feedback loop, right? Every detection that wasn't prevented uh, is a failure of protection, right? And every detection that leads to a response is a chance to both improve detection and response. So there doesn't need to be um, an anchorman style gang fight right, between uh, the various news organizations um, in the security space. Each one of these should create a feedback loop for the others. And then finally, Security is important now, and organizations understand that, right? There's lots of media attention. There's board attention. Um, we're well aware of the skills gap and the types of um, security practitioners that we need. And I think that's tremendous for security because what that ultimately means is that that increased demand is leading to more opportunities for security practitioners, more abilities to contribute, and it's leading to more skills and more opportunities uh, for us to train and hone uh, our skill sets so we can ultimately become you know, more mature as a set of practitioners. And so I, I think that um, security becoming more important is both awesome for us uh, at a 
from a visibility standpoint, right, it makes our mission matter. But I think more than that, it also means that we're getting the sponsorship to get better at what we do. Uh, so I, I think that's fantastic. That's everything I had. With that, I want to turn things over to uh, today from uh, Tripwire. So take it away. Great. Th thanks, Jeff. Great information and, and great insight into what's going on in security organizations today. I, I want to follow up on Jeff's presentation and spend just a few minutes talking about how Tripwire fits into building a cyber resilient organization. You, you heard Jeff talk about the increased complexity uh, that organizations are dealing with today. I, I love that. That's like three clouds, nine different versions of a cloud. Uh, you know, I think that really, uh, you know, really speaks to, you know, how hard the security problem that large organizations are trying to solve is today. Um, and it's not just the, the distinguishing between cloud or on-premise servers, but it's all the different kinds of applications uh, and virtual systems and private cloud and hybrid cloud environments that organizations need to deal with. Uh, in fact, I saw a statistic as you look at all the growth of cloud and different kinds of devices coming online that across the globe, there's over 5 million new devices getting connected online today every single day. Uh, and so for your organization, uh, that's certainly a big challenge people have to deal with. Now, Tripwire has been helping customers protect their critical systems for almost 20 years now. Uh, we focus the Tripwire around foundational security controls, meaning the fundamental parts of your security program that every organization just absolutely has to have. And we've been doing this for thousands of customers across many millions of assets for many years. Our customers use Tripwire solutions in three distinct but very interconnected areas. First, around security, and I'm going to talk more about that security use cases that customers use our products for in the next slide, but it's around providing these fundamental security controls. Second, for compliance, whether it be PCI, NERC, or a myriad of other regulations, having the controls that Tripwire offers in place have become requirements of many of these regulatory standards. And beyond that, uh, beyond just having the control there, to demonstrate that you're doing these basics of security. Tripwire also helps to automate a lot of the manual effort associated with documenting and providing evidence for these controls. And that helps our customers reduce the time they spent on their compliance efforts. Third, for IT operations, and this is really goes back to this point of building a cyber resilient organization. You know, resilience is about building a more secure environment, but it's also about building something that uh, can be better reacting in the face of on, you know, undesirable changes, be more resilient to potentials for downtime, and, and just build a, a better IT organization as a whole. Our customers use Tripwire products as part of their change control processes, uh, and where we fit there is being that validation piece that tells you what's actually happening on your critical systems and help you differentiate between authorized and unauthorized changes, and that helps to provide a more resilient environment. For many of our customers, our controls are the definitive source of just knowing what's on the network, uh, and that comes from our asset discovery and application discovery capabilities. I want to focus on security uh, for one minute here and talk about what do I mean by foundational security controls. First, uh, Tripwire has been synonymous in the market for a long time with identifying changes and system or file integrity monitoring. Tripwire logs and records all the changes happening on your critical systems, but it has a sophisticated system for integrating into an environment so that it doesn't just log every change in your environment, but helps you distinguish good change from bad, authorized change from unauthorized change, and helping you deliver the context and relevant data about that change to the person who's best equipped to act on that information in your organization. Security configuration auditing is the next use case we fulfill. Tripwire has the broadest library of pre-built policies in the industry based on security hardening guides, best practices, and regulatory standards to help you determine if your system configured in accordance with third-party standards, or for larger organizations, your own internal configuration standards. And then it continuously monitors for that compliance going forward. We have a comprehensive network-based vulnerability management system that's part of our solution that identifies where the risks are in assets and helps you manage the process of prioritizing, identifying the most important risks to deal with, and act on that information. Now, all of this information is really important for security, but Jeff made a really good point earlier, which is SOCs are getting too many alerts today. Uh, and being able to filter and put that human effort towards figuring out which of these do I want to deal with is a real challenge. 
So we've been very focused at Tripwire on building the automation around all of this information we collect. So it's not just producing a, a fire hose of every change happening to every system in your organization, but really helping you prioritize and identify which of those changes and risks that are most important for you to deal with and help you build an efficient process that automates and isolates those critical issues that you really need to know about right now. So those use cases I mentioned, they break into the products that we offer at Tripwire, and those are around a couple of key functions, vulnerability management, as I mentioned, security configuration management, and integrity monitoring. Those would be the kind of controls that you might see in a regulatory framework or a security framework saying you need to have these kind of things in place in your organization. Now, I want to touch on one other point that Jeff made around threat intelligence, because I think that was a really important point. The, the idea that threat intelligence you know, at its raw form is just more data for your organization. That's something that really resonated in what you said, Jeff, with customers that I've talked to around those threat intelligence sources that they're getting in as well. Uh, if all you're getting in is a bunch of file hashes or IP addresses, that's, you know, that's data, but it's not really intelligence or knowledge that you can actually make use of in your organization. So what we've been doing at Tripwire is really focusing on how could we use threat intelligence not to create more data, but actually to filter out and give you less information uh, out of our systems. So you kind of think of it conversely of instead of producing more data, we're actually using the intelligence to help filter down what's the really important information that you absolutely need to look at. One of the questions when I talk to CISOs and they get threat intelligence feeds in, uh, sometimes they're reading a document or an email talking about uh, a new threat that's just come out. They, they want to answer the question, well, do I actually have any of that on any of my systems in my organization? So that's what we've done with Tripwire Enterprise, our, our flagship product, which is integrate through open standards, uh, which includes Stakes, Taxi, and Cybox, to be able to pull in threat intelligence feeds into our system and then do two things with it. One, because Tripwire is forensically logging and creating a history of all of the changes happening to all of the systems you're monitoring with our products, we can go back in history and say, did we ever see one of these indicators of compromise before? So even if it was a day, a week, a month ago, we could say, did we see that even before we knew it was in uh, an IOC that might have come into the organization? The second thing we can do is as we start monitoring for changes, every time we're monitoring a change and we see something happen, we can go back to those list of indicators that we got. And indicators, they could come from open source feeds. It could come from a commercial threat intelligence uh, subscription. It could come from places like uh, an ISAC that might be sharing information and intelligence between peers. We take all that information in and we help to identify if we see a change and it matches an IOC, well, now that's something that your, your SOC uh, administrator or your analyst is going to want to deal with in a very different way than something that was just simply an unauthorized change but wasn't really done with any malicious intent. So we can help to drive different kind of workflow based upon the threat intelligence matching that we can do in our product. One other uh, point I want to touch on based on one other thing that Jeff said, which was you know, talked, he talked about APIs uh, and the need to automate more of the controls. Well, one of the things that we've recognized at Tripwire now for many years is you know, you're, very few companies have one security vendor. Most of the companies that I talk to, they have a myriad of different technologies covering different parts of the security ecosystem. And for many years, they've been operating a lot of these in silos. We've been working really hard with our partners and other companies in the security world to break out of those silos and start to build a comprehensive security ecosystem so that technologies and products can interoperate in an automated way so that we can break down some of these barriers and reduce the number of tools and the number of different consoles that someone would need to go to. Uh, just an example of what we could do with some of our partners is this idea of change validation with IT operation systems. So knowing whether there was a change control ticket that was created uh, associated with a particular change can help you very quickly filter out was a change good or bad. Uh, another example, if you wanted to use a, a, a SIM tool or a log management tool or even something like a Splunk for aggregating data from numerous systems, we integrate with all of those different systems so you can get the data for our customers where they want it, when they want it, to make it most easily accessible. And we've also done a lot of integrations to different threat intelligence feeds, uh, malware sandboxes uh, with partners like FireEye. So 
that's really all I wanted to cover with Tripwire. Now, you need a solid foundation for your security programs, and Tripwire provides you with those proven solutions that are essential to any good security program. We are those foundational controls for security, compliance, and IT operations. And we help our, support our customers through our technology, but also our people and the partnerships we've built up with other security vendors and IT operation vendors over the years. With that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and thank Jeff for his presentation. And we do have a few minutes for questions. So let me start out uh, and look at the uh, Q&A list and uh, start out with a question for Jeff. Uh, Jeff, you talked about cyber resilience. Um, for, for many organizations, uh, they'd like to know, uh, how do you measure resilience for your organization? Yeah, that's one that, that we get a lot, especially myself and um, Renee Murphy, one of our other analysts here who focuses on the GRC. I'd say one of the most important things about resilience is thinking about the organization in terms of maturity, right? Resilience is about um, repeatability and being able to return the environment um, to, to the desired state both during an incident and, um, and after one. And so because of that, you have to have solid metrics, you have to have repeatable and mature processes, and you have to have um, a, a technology layer that facilitates visibility. And so um, I, I think a key way to do that is to really think about it in terms um, of maturity because maturity is controllable. Um, it's often cross-framework uh, uh, from the standpoint of applying to a number of different uh, frameworks that you may want to uh, think about security from. And it also allows you to gauge the areas where you need to improve. Um, Forrester has the information security and maturity model that we work with a number of clients that uh, pulls from others and also maps to things like an ISP, uh, ISO, et cetera, and that's a common way for us to talk to customers about it because it really does break things into people, process, technology, and oversight, which allows you to understand exactly where you are and where your gaps are. Great. Uh, another question here uh, around your, uh, the, the idea of moving to the cloud. Um, how do we trust cloud service providers' internal penetration test or scan reports? Super important question. Uh, in fact, I have a report um, making its way to our site now about some of the recent vulnerabilities that have been discovered in um, security technologies, right? Because this is obviously a massive issue, and the things that you that you trust to protect you are the very things that um, are actually creating risk uh, from a security organization. The first thing is you want to make sure that they're actually conducting security tests. Uh, that, that's number one, right? So you want a red team assessment. You want results of their penetration tests. Um, you want to understand that, but you want to go further than a spreadsheet if you can, right? A lot of organizations kind of have a third-party risk uh, spreadsheet. You really need to do more than that. What you really want to do is, is work with your potential vendor to understand is security part of their culture or is security part of a checklist? And if security is part of their culture, then you should be looking for things like how security is integrated into their software development life cycle, um, how security is, into, is integrated into their continuous improvement, um, how they're doing security-based static or dynamic analysis from a software perspective um, as they're deploying code. Um, you also want to understand what the boundaries of control are, right? So who has access to what and whose responsibility uh, it is when you have an incident based on some of those tabletops and things like that. I think by and large, right, it's not unreasonable to say that cloud providers do a pretty solid job of security, and especially when compared to mid-sized organizations that don't have huge teams, they often do somewhat of a better job as a whole in thinking about security, but it is multi-tenant infrastructure. You do want to trust but verify, and you want to go a step beyond simply a checklist and instead verify that security is more than a pen test. It's a red team. It's in the software development life cycle. It's part of the background check to the organization. And that company has very clearly mapped out what you're responsible for and what they're responsible for as part of your agreement. Great. Thanks for that answer. Uh, next question. Uh, it's uh, more on the tripwire side, so I'll answer this one. Uh, how do you help filter down which changes you really need to pay attention to for your organization is the question. Um, you know, and this is something that we've actually been helping our customers deal with for a long time, uh, even going back to early days, people dealing with PCI regulation uh, and early PCI specs saying you need to be monitoring your system for changes. 
And so, you know, first thing people do is you just turn on the monitoring. And, and now I have this audit trail of every change happening to, you know, for a Windows system in your system 32 folder, um, which is great information. I'm complying with the regulation. Um, but have I actually improved my security in doing that? Well, this is, this is the intersection between compliance and security. Um, you might have fulfilled the spirit of the, you know, the, the, the letter of the control, but maybe not the spirit, which is we're trying to figure out did someone maliciously change one of these things and, and would we be aware of it if it happened? Uh, we've built a variety of automated techniques in our product to help um, filter those things out. Uh, one thing we have is something we call dynamic software reconciliation. So all the regular updates from people like Microsoft or Red Hat, all of your standard patches you're putting on, well, I, you know, if those are trusted files uh, and those are the updates that I expect to have on a system, uh, I shouldn't have a SOC person looking at those changes. Uh, I should filter all of those out. Same thing I talked before about change control. Uh, our integrations to uh, malware sandboxes that do detonation of executables is another way that we help our customers do filtering. So a new executable shows up, we've never seen it before. Well, let's ask someone who has expertise in uh, disassembling binaries have you ever seen this before anywhere on any system at any customer? Uh, and if so, is it a good or a bad file? Uh, and if you've never seen it before, and that's usually the case with most zero day malware, let's detonate it, let's figure out is it doing something malicious? Does it have signs that would look, make it look like it's a suspicious file? And if it is, you know, ultimately that's the context that helps someone in the SOC make a very informed rapid decision of, hey, this is the one change I need to really spend a lot of time on and here are the 900 other changes that are normal part of doing daily business and I can safely and securely ignore. Uh, next question here for Jeff uh, on the, uh, the skills gap. Uh, this question here is, do you see the skills gap changing? Um, and if you don't see it changing, how, how should organizations adapt to this world where we're constantly short staffed? Definitely see the skills gap changing. This is something I'll have some research uh, coming out on in, in fourth quarter and, and first quarter of next year because it's such an important topic. Um, what's interesting about the skills gap and how it's changing right now is that it, it's not too dissimilar uh, to what you see in sort of legacy IT where the sysadmin role is important, but it's changed, right? And you can look at things like a site responsibility engineer um, that other organizations have as kind of an example of this where it's heavy on automation, it's heavy on scripting, um, and it's not, a, it's not a pure technology admin job anymore. Uh, and I think that we're very much going to see that in the security space as well. When I find organizations that are already doing this, what they're ultimately doing is they're building teams internally that have a specialty. So they're not getting rid of technical skills by any stretch, right? Um, instead, they're, they're really focusing on what they want to maintain expertise on. That might be network architecture. Certainly could be, right? It could be firewall engineering. Um, but instead, what I tend to find them doing is that they pick their areas of specialty. Um, it certainly, as you mentioned, they could be things like malware analysis. Um, and they'll build pockets of that expertise. And then they look to augment themselves with their product and service vendors so that they have technologies that really deliver outcomes that augment um, the skill sets that they've identified internally. So if they can't staff a capability, then they may turn to a service provider, but they also want to make sure their technology investments facilitate that. And I think your example before around things like being spirit of compliance uh, versus technical control, right? Um, that's a great example of it, of where the organization may not want someone to drive the technology that facilitates that compliance. Instead, they want a resource that focuses on risk management and compliance. And so that skill set of technology specialist changes into more strategic risk and compliance specialist. Um, you know, and the technology itself is something that they leverage to accomplish that goal, or perhaps they work with a service provider in a partner ecosystem to do that. I'd say at a SOC analyst, as a specific example, we're seeing things like SOC analyst skills changing from, um, you know, very sort of technology and administration focused instead to being much more focused on uh, investigative skills as well as scripting, Python, uh, and things like that. Th those are sort of the common changes that we're seeing. Specialty combined with more strategic skills in areas like risk, fraud management, compliance, investigation, not as focused on driving technology.
and it's great to hear that optimism. Um, you know, I've, I've been reading the ISACA surveys around the skills shortage uh, that they've put out every over the last couple of years, and uh, certainly it hasn't gotten better yet. Um, but uh, hopefully, looking to the future, we, you know, we will see some improvement there. Uh, one of the interesting data points I saw out of the, the 2016 ISACA survey was, um, although it, it, it takes uh, on average uh, three months or more to fill these open positions today, half the time people hire someone, they end up hiring someone who wasn't qualified for the job anyway. Um, so, you know, this idea of getting better training uh, and you know, finding a better fit for the organization is certainly important. Uh, well, we have time for uh, one more question here. Uh, so I'll give you uh, the final question here, Jeff. Um, Process and awareness are key for information security. What do you think when the organization lacks both of those things? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> when they lack both of those things. So to go back to maturity, right, as an example, um, I think understanding that you lack both of those things is a place to start, right? Um, and then it becomes a situation that you want to, in a targeted manner, with those specialties, with the skill sets, with the vendors that organization has turned to, with the service providers that organization has turned to, start to figure out if the gaps are real, if they're perceived, if all new investments are needed, or if um, reallocation of investments is needed, right, to take advantage of those things. The ultimate answer is um, you want to take an approach that allows you um, the ability in the future to be able to optimize the decisions you're making. And so if you think about your processes, if you think about your technologies, if you think about your people, uh, not from the standpoint of simply the binary of do I have this or not, but instead think about it in terms of uh, how can I measure it? What will that measurement look like and how will I define success? How do I make it repeatable based on that measurement? How do I use that to drive decisions? And then how can I use all of those to optimize um, and to make things better and improve? That's where you start to solve process gaps, awareness gaps, technology gaps, and people gaps. But it ultimately boils down to thinking about the entirety of the security program as a series of strategic investments with outcomes desired that enable you to facilitate measurement, improvement, um, and repeatability. And if you do it that way, the problem, I don't want to say it solves itself because it's hard but it gets you down the road to solving it. Great. Thanks Thanks for that data. Um, with that, uh, I think we're out of time for questions, so I will pass it back to Kate for the wrap-up. All right. Thank you, Dave. Um, I would like to thank our presenters today, our guest speaker, Jeff Pollard of Forrester, and Dave Meltzer of Tripwire. And thank you, audience, for uh, being here today. We appreciate it. We know you're busy, and thanks for spending your time with us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version of the webcast and the slide deck via SlideShare. Also, if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for being at this webcast, please respond to the follow-up email. We hope that you'll join us for future webcasts. Uh, check out our webcast schedule at tripwire.com, and also check out our award-winning blog, The State of Security, to find out the latest in security news as well as thought-provoking security topics. Thank you and have a great day.